This program is brought to you by Emory University. Today, our speaker is Dr. Annie Ho. Uh, for those that have not yet met Annie, Annie is a first year fellow in our clinical track. She is uh, a Florida native, uh, went to undergraduate and medical school at Florida International University, came here to Emory for her resident where she was uh, a fantastic resident. Uh, we were uh, thrilled when she matched with us last year. Uh, and as you can see, she's going to talk to us about cardiac sarcoidosis. Annie. Thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Williams. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Annie Ho. As Dr. Williams said, I'm one of the current first year fellows. Today, I'll be talking about cardiac sarcoid. With the increasing awareness of cardiac manifestation of uh, sarcoidosis and the widespread availability of advanced imaging, um, it's led to a tidal wave of interest in this condition that was once considered rare. So that's the reason why I chose this topic. I'm also on my imaging month right now at the VA um, and have been involved in different sarcoid cases too, including a couple from this rotation. I have no disclosures. So this morning, I would like to go through a comprehensive review of cardiac sarcoid, but focus on these objectives. So we'll identify common presenting symptoms of cardiac sarcoid, discuss the multi-modality diagnostic approach of cardiac sarcoid, and then review the treatments. So we'll start with the case. This particular patient I took care of at the Emory Cardiac Critical Care Unit. This patient at this point has been admitted several times with worsening heart failure symptoms. And in this particular hospitalization, he was transferred from the floor to the unit in cardiogenic shock after being um, non-responsive to aggressive IV diuresis. So our patient is a 59-year-old African-American male with a history of systemic sarcoidosis with pulmonary involvement. He was initially diagnosed in 2007 and then in January of, of 2018, so like 10 years later, um, he was being evaluated for newly depressed EF. So at that time, because of his history of pulmonary sarcoid, uh, a cardiac MRI was done and it showed no delayed gadolinium enhancement to just to suggest a myocardial scar or fibrosis. There wasn't any pericardial enhancement at all and no typical MR findings of cardiac sarcoid. The patient also underwent a left heart cath um, as well that showed, didn't show any new obstructive CAD. And then when he was admitted a year later for this decompensated systolic heart failure, um, he had a right heart cath that revealed a low cardiac index and he was in cardiogenic shock. At that time, um, the echo was done and his LVEF was 20%. He required anotropes and aggressive diuresis. At that time, he wasn't an LBAD candidate due to the RV failure. And then also there's con concerns regarding transplant candidacy given the syst uh, systemic sarcoid with prior lung involvement. The reason why I um, wanted to bring this case and is because although the MRI was negative, he still had a high suspicion of cardiac sarcoid. He had some NSVT, new heart failure, history of sarcoidosis. And um, when we reviewed the echo, it had this aneurysmal basal septum motion about it that made us rethink further diagnostic methods for a cardiac sarcoid in this particular patient. Okay, so let's start with the review of sarcoidosis, which is a chronic multi-system disorder without any defined etiology. And I feel like to better understand the diagnostic approaches and treatment of cardiac sarcoid, um, reviewing the pathophysiology and epidemiology of sarcoidosis will help. So it can affect almost every system in the body, most commonly the pulmonary system, as you could see, skin findings include lupus uh, perneo. The nervous system can also be affected. There's various um, associations that have been described, including occupational and env environmental exposures to so things like beryllium, dust, and really just agents that typically that can cause asthma. Various microorganisms like mycobacteria have been associated. Um, and the current evidence suggests that sarcoid results from an exaggerated cellular immune response with a variety of antigen or self-antigens that cause the CD4, otherwise known as the T-helper cells, um, 
to accumulate, activate, and release these like inflammatory cytokines that eventually leads to granuloma formation. So like I said, it affects almost every organ, but classically what you'll see is um, lymph, swollen lymph nodes and then the presence of non-caseating granulomas, which are composed of, which compose of aggregate of epithelioid cells, Langerhans cells, foreign body cells, like giant cells in the center, and then it's surrounded by um, lymphocytes and plasma cells and mast cells. That's just the scientific background of it. So cardiac sarcoid or sarcoidosis in general is often more seen in young adults. Sarcoid, uh, so sarcoidosis affects about 60 people per 100,000 in the US. So that's about like 200,000 people overall living with sarcoidosis in the US. Um, the patients usually suffer from pulmonary manifestation of this disease, but again, it could affect any organ. Given that we're cardiologists or in the cardiac field, um, I'll focus on the cardiac involvement of this multi-system disease. So um, there, one of the studies I found, myocardial granulomas were actually detected in about almost a quarter of um, 84 aut autopsy of patients with pulmonary sarcoid. And then um, in the same study, Japanese patients with sarcoid um, uh, sarcoidosis, cardiac involvement was reported as high as almost 60%. And as we know, prognosis of uh, sarcoidosis is not well defined. Um, the earlier studies and showed like with people with symptomatic uh, cardiac sarcoid was limited to the survival is limited to two years. But later, there are um, later studies where the survival for five years was about like forty to to sixty percent. So right now, if you have systemic sarcoid, it's approximately about two to 5% of people will be diagnosed with a cardiac sarcoid as well. But um, from this study, it's much higher. It could be up to a quarter or a third of patients. This side, a slide focuses on three main clinical sequelae of cardiac sarcoidosis, which can range from asymptomatic conduction abnormality to a fatal ventricular arrhythmia, and depending on the location and extent of granulomatous formation. So about a quarter to two thirds of patient will have some form of AV block. Um, it ranges anywhere from like 12 to 60% with um, that could have bundle branch blocks, and almost a third could have uh, complete heart block. Less than 15% will have uh, vent superventricular tachycardias, whereas up to 42% can have uh, ventricular tachycardia, and then anywhere from 12 to 65% could have present with sudden cardiac death. And then about 10% to 30% of people with cardiac sarcoid can have heart failure, which is attributed to like a wide, widespread infiltration in the myocardium. It could be from ventricular aneurysm, rhythm disturbances, choropulmonale caused by pulmonary hypertension, and then by valvular regurge or a combination of any of these processes really. Okay, so this slide depicts the different locations and extent of granulomatous in, uh, inflammation. So as we know, sarcoid has a patchy involvement in the myocardium. You could um, have small patches of the basal, uh, of basal involvement, which clinically can be silent, whereas a larger area um, of septal involvement can manifest as heart block, um, as that is where our conduction system runs through. And then the bottom, if you look at the bottom left image, it demonstrates a possible like re-entrant circuit involving the areas of granuloma and fibrosis that can lead to VT. And then the bottom right image shows extensive biventricular myocardial involvement, which can manifest as um, any three of our clinical sequelae, heart block, arrhythmias, or heart failure. Okay. So this table illustrates the common presentations of patients with cardiac sarcoid, mostly detected by AV blocks, which we typically seen and we don't really think twice like, oh, does this patient have cardiac sarcoid? Um, and then as you could see, 40% of patients can present with left-sided heart failure. Um, however, they could also present with syncope, palpitations, chest pain. One in 10 can present with bradycardia, but that could be also part of um, uh, represented in AV blocks. Cardiac sarcoid um, can cause an infiltrative and restrictive cardiomyopathy. 
So the infiltrative characteristic is the deposition of abnormal substances within cellular and intracellular space, which can lead to development of um, ventricular diastolic dysfunction, systolic dysfunction, or really both. And then granulomatous infiltration leading to the, the disruption of normal organ function. That's the major pathologic feature of sarcoidosis. So this is a diagrammatic representation of the most common sites of sarcoid granulomas in the heart. This is taken from a review article from the International Journal of Cardiology uh, by Kendallin in 2015. And as we could see here, it has a propensity for the base and the septum. So there are three main guidelines guidelines or like criteria that exists uh, for sarcoid or cardiac sarcoidosis. The Japanese Ministry of Health and Welfare, um, the Heart Rhythm Asso Society, and then the World Association for Sarcoidosis and Other um, Granulomatous Disorder. So WASOG is the short name for it. So the guidelines don't include these lab tests. However, this is a brief review of lab tests that we frequently order in the workup of sarcoidosis or just to think about. And typically, if you're um, seeing these patients, they already have uh, most of these labs. So complete blood count um, with differential looking for like anemia, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, LFTs, um, elevated OCFOS. Um, can suggest diffuse granulomatous hepatic involvement, and then elevated serum angiotensin converting enzyme. You could also get ADA levels, serum amyloid A, which is active inflammation, and then soluble interleukin-2 receptor. So this is an old school test. Um, some of us might know, I didn't know, uh, the, the chem test, which is basically very similar to the TB skin test and evokes gran sarcoid granulomatous response in people who have it. So it, it's an it's old, an old uh, thing. Uh, oh, oh. Like the the controls. Okay, thank you. Um, where part of the spleen of a patient with known sarcoidosis is injected to the skin of a patient with suspected disease. And if non-caseating granulomas are found four to six weeks later, the test is considered positive. And for obvious reasons, this test is not routinely used. Here, we're gonna look at the Japanese Ministry of Health and Welfare criteria for the diagnosis of uh, cardiac sarcoid. So its criteria for diagnosis include clinical and histologic extra cardiac sarcoid. So you have to have like pulmonary sarcoid or, you know, sarcoid proven somewhere else. And then two of these major criteria, or you could have one plus two major criteria. And then um, in 2017, actually, the guidelines were revised and changed a few things. So it allowed for diagnosis of isolated cardiac sarcoid without uh, a positive endomyocardial biopsy, or you could have like a moved fatal arrhythmias like BT, abnormal wall abnormalities such as the aneurysm, elevated um, myocardial uptake of the FDG PET, and then late gadolinium enhancement in MRI, it moved it up from minor to major criteria. This is the Heart Rhythm Society guidelines, last updated in 2014, as a histologic diagnosis of um, extra cardiac sarcoid with one clinical criteria. This here is the World um, Association for Sarcoidosis and Other Granulomatous Disease, WASOG, um, otherwise known, was devised in 1999 um, as part of a case control ideology of sarcoidosis study, access study. Um, and then it was revised in 2014. But basically, this criteria is expanded upon the HRS consistent. So very similar. So this table just reviews other non-laboratory methods of diagnosis for cardiac sarcoid. Um, common things that we get like EKG, or if you're suspecting arrhythmia, um, a halter, echo, and then other imaging that we'll go into. Okay, this slide focuses on the methods of diagnosis that I'll be reviewing in detail. Okay, so we'll go first into endomyocardial biopsy, which is the gold standard for the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid, um, given its high specificity, given that it's difficult to get affected tissue in the, uh, because cardiac sarcoid is very patchy. 
It frequently, and sarcoid frequently involves the intraventricular septum and, and um, the LV. This method of diagnosis therefore has low sensitivity and only about, uh, a positive biopsy results in a quarter of patients who have cardiac sarcoid based on an autopsy study. So combined with potential complication in this invasive procedure, current, um, currently is limited to limited to wide uh, spread use of endomyocardial biopsy in the diagnostic pathway of these patients with suspected cardiac uh, sarcoid. So endomyocardial biopsy involves jugular vein puncture, um, the biotome illustrated here, through a sheath and then it goes into the right ventricle under echocardiographic uh, um, help. And then usually you harvest multiple specimen of the myocardial tissue from the apical segment to the right side of the um, interventricular septum. And then we use um, transthoracic echocardiogram routinely um, during the, the biopsy, not only to steer the tip of the biotome, but also to assess the incidental acute complications, which can include tricuspid injury and then pericardial effusion. And then as you can see from an image up here, the echo guiding the biotome. And then this right here is just a gross specimen of the heart. And can, you could kind of see some of the patchy granulomatous involvement, but really it's done by histology. Let's see. So this picture illust illustrates the histology of what we would find, which is a non-caseating granuloma. Next, we'll discuss the utilization of transthoracic echocardiogram for the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid. So there was a study by uh, Meta in the American Thoracic Society Journal that found that echocardiographic uh, abnormalities only present about a quarter of patients who exhibit a uh, positive MRI or a positive FEG PET study with evidence of uh, sarcoidosis. The limitation um, includes user dependence, so it depends on echo text and then echocardiographers who are reading the studies, um, which can be missed if the interpreter may not be aware of our high clinical uh, suspicion of this patient. So as in this case, it wasn't called on the echo report until we were running with the CCU team and we looked at the echo ourselves and pointed out the, the aneurysmal motion of the basal septum. Um, so findings you'll see is thinning and akinesia of the basal septum, aneurysmal dilation of the inferior or posterior lateral wall. And of note, these abnormal echo findings are, um, the buzzword is in non-coronary distribution. So this picture of a sarcoid um, echo demonstrates that focal thinning of the basal septum, hence the arrow. And then these images demonstrate the aneurysmal dilation of the LV wall. Um, let's see. And then right here, here, there's arrows for you guys to see. Next, we're gonna focus on cardiac MRI. So cardiac MRI has high sensitivity, almost 100%, and pretty good specificity too. Um, the limitations include that it's expensive. It's not widely available. There's contraindications in people with, or patients with older devices, metals, cochlear implant, or renal involvement. Okay. And then the findings is uh, you would look for delayed uh, gadolinium enhancement. Um, it shows, a, you'll see a variable pattern of late gadolinium enhancement as like scar or fibrotic tissue will hold on to the gadolinium longer than the normal tissue. Um, typically, you'll see mid-wall or epicardial um, bright white on the MRI that represents the scar of fibrosis. You'll see a like hyper intense foci um, on the black blood with the T-weighted images. And then because it's patchy, you'll see more like the patchy involvement in the imaging. So this image up here is taken uh, from the AHA journal. And then the first picture, you'll see this is a normal heart. Um, the LV looks like a donut shape and it's all black. There's no uh, late gadolinium enhancement. And then here you'll see early, um, like if this is, would be an early diagnosis with enhancement in, that, in the RV insertion right here, that bright white that is uh, represents 
uh, that represents the delayed gadolinium enhancement. In this picture right here, you'll see that um, the lateral wall of the L, sorry, can you see my mouse? Uh, the lateral wall of the LV is affected, the RV, and then at the RV insertion site too, here. And then, um, and then the last one, you'll see extensive LGE, so end stage dilated LV, extensive white with large disease burden on the basal um, inferior septal triangle. Uh, in, in, sorry, what you'll see is dilated LV and then also diffuse disease right here. One thing I wanted to point it out that's also a buzzword for kind of just raising red flags for thinking about sarcoid if you're getting an MRI on someone maybe for a different reason um, is this triangular sign right here. And this is just when it there's um, delayed gadolinium enhancement in the basal inferior septal tri um, triangle right here. Sorry, my mouse is finicky. Um, the other limitation when you're looking at MRI is that late gadolinium enhancement can be from also ischemia or myocarditis. So you can't necessarily say that, you know, it's for sure sarcoid since there isn't a specific um, finding of sarcoid versus other things that could cause scar, fibrosis, um, or edema. Okay, so I just kind of put this in there. It's very similar to the last one, and it represents like different involvement in the MRI and what you could see. So if you see right here, um, there's subendocardial delayed enhancement in the anterior lateral wall, and you could see it here on the MRI. So there are just different cases that you could look through, um, and you'll see. It could be patchy, multifocal, more in the late disease versus early disease, you'll see kind of just a patch. Next, we're gonna move on to PET perfusion imaging. Um, so FPG PET, it has pretty good sensitivity and pretty good specificity. Um, the main limitation is gonna be the sarcoid diet. So I put this QR code for, for you guys, um, if you wanna scan it, it shows you the protocol um, for the diet, but um, basically you have to be on a low carb, high fat, high protein diet, which our cardiac patients would love um, to eat bacon and eggs and whatnot. So uh, what you can do with the PET perfusion imaging is that you, it could be performed for the perfusion part, um, tagged, uh, tracers like ammonia or rubidium. And then uh, depending on the metabolic condition of the normal myocardium, so it, you, the my, normal myocardium consume both glucose and free, uh, free fatty acids. So, you know, there's se several strategies for preparations that have uh, been developed to suppress the normal myocardial uptake of the 18F uh, FDG in order to distinguish from active inflammation uh, within granulomas from normal FDG uptake. So based on our experiences, the we, that's why we recommend on high fat and low uh, carb diet. And the issue is that it's it's hard to get patients to truly do the diet, and you know sometimes they'll sneak in a candy bar here or there. Um, so what you'll find is focal FBG uptake in the PET imaging, and then PET can also be useful for disease detection, and also because it's a whole body scan, you could detect extra cardiac involvement and treatment response. Okay, so this demonstrates how, um, how it should be if you have like an increased FBG uptake and inflammation. And then it also looks at the perfusion uh, metabolism. So here, this would be normal. So normal perfusion, okay, no defect here. And then no, um, no increased FBG uptake, meaning that, that this would be a negative sarcoid study. Whereas here, you'll see uh, mild to no defect, but then you'll see that there is metabolism uptake, okay? And then here, there's moderate defect right here. And then there's um, FBG uptake in the, in the affected area. And then here near, this would be more in the scar burnt out phase where you have severe defect and then minimal 
to know like FDG uptake. So this was a case that, um, that we had here at the VA this month, it was on the consult service, and we did an MPI spec for the perfusion part, which showed a 10% reversible defect in the apical area. And then um, we did the FDG PET, and as you could see, there's focal enhancement here in the, in the LV apex, sorry. This was a review, uh, I thought it was a great review for FDG and the use of FDG and cardiac sarcoid if anyone's interested. So, okay, so next I wanna talk about this study by Blankstein that was published in the Journal of American College Cardiology and, um, and in, in imaging that looked at PET for prognostic assessment. Um, this study was had about 100, and 18 patients um, with a history, with no history of CAD, but referred to PET um, using the FDG PET um, and rubidium to evaluate for perfusion defect. So they followed the high fat, low carb diet to suppress the normal myocardial glucose up uptake. And they had blind readings of the PET and um, they looked at adverse e events. So death or sustain VT and then um, mostly looking at the EMRs or defibrillator interrogation, patient questionnaire and telephone interviews. And the main, uh, the mean follow-up was about 1.5 years. So one and a half years. And basically um, this is looking at how PET and perfusion can, um, can help you with the prognosis. So with the, from what they've found was that the presence of focal um, perfusion defect, and if you have FDG uptake on the cardiac PET, they identified that these patients were at higher risk of um, death or VT. So right here, if you look at um, this table or this diagram, if you have abnormal perfusion and if you have um, FDG uptake, then you have a, almost a threefold increase in VT or death. And then interestingly, what they also found was um, if you have abnormal or if you have focal uptake in the RV, so having RV disease alone, you have a five-fold increase in the risk of death. Okay, so, you know, all in all, you know, when you suspect with a patient with cardiac sarcoid, what should you do first is, is usually the question, what kind of imaging? Currently, the go-to first is going to be your cardiac MRI. Um, if it's positive, then you know you could then you know you could treat the patient. And then if there is no late gadolinium enhancement, but you're still you still have a high clinical suspicion that you should get the PET because the PET's going to help you with also prognosis and, and determining treatment. So if you have no FDG uptake, maybe you have a scar and just like the image we looked at earlier, there was no uptake because there's just burnt out um, sorry, uh, cardiac sarcoid. And then there would be no role for immunosuppressive uh, therapy. But if you have an abnormal uh, FEG uptake, then you would consider immunosuppressive therapy because there's still inflammation there. This was also taken uh, from Blankstein. And then the QR code will take you directly to the, um, to the article. Give it a second if anyone wants to scan that. Okay. So imaging key points. Um, Transthoracic echo, low sensitivity, but look for that basal thinning, um, septal basal thinning or ventricular aneurysm in a non-coronary distribution. MRI is great for, because of its negative predictive value um, and your go-to for the initial imaging. And then FEG PET, limited really by diet. Um, it's, it's a hard diet for patients to follow. So it you know, can mess up your images and then um, it can predict prognosis. But remember it is a CT PET. So you would be exposed, uh, be exposing the patients to non or ionizing radiation. Okay, so back to the case. 
So considering um, the cardiac MR is 97% uh, sensitivity and can be range anywhere from 75 to 100% specificity, it'd be reasonable to kind of forego further testing. However, given that aneurysmal basal bow, uh, sept like bowing of the septal wall on the echo, we wanted to further investigate um, cardiac sarcoid. The patient then underwent an FDG PET which did illustrate significant uptake in the myocardium. Um, so we treated the patient with high dose steroids and ultimately he was weaned off by anotropes and um, his EF improved to 50% at the time of discharge. Let's see if this will play. This is his echo when he um, came in parasternal long access. You could, you could see what um, that, aneurysmal septal motion right here that we talked about. Here's another, we'll go to the apical view where I think you can see it a little bit better right here. Oh, there's this. Okay. And this was also his FDG PET. As you could see, there's uptake on the RV. And we talked about earlier, if you have uptake in the RV, um, it's poor prognosis as you have a five, uh, five-fold increase of having sustained ET or death. And unfortunately, this patient did well for a while, um, but he did pass away from sustained VT about a year later. Okay, so moving on to treatment. Early treatment is crucial in improving symptoms and prognosis. So we'll briefly review the treatment of cardiac sarcoidosis. The primary treatment is really steroids, um, but consider other medications for our steroids non-responders. So other medications, including other immunosuppressants like methotrexate, lefutamide, mycophenolate, mofetil, and then your plecronil, um, isothioprine, and then TNF-alpha, um, TNF alpha antagonists are also used for like refractory disease, but really those should be third line treatment. And then this is kind of like a diagram that illustrates the treatment approach for newly diagnosed sarc uh, cardiac sarcoids. So you could start with high dose prednisone, 60 to 80 milligrams a day, and then reevaluate re in a few months. If they're responders, um, then you could gradually taper over the next six months or so and eventually taper them off. If they're non-responders, then you would think about the uh, alternative agents that we talked about. Okay, so given that sarcoidosis is a multi-system disease, it requires a multidisciplinary approach for treatment. So we already discussed steroids in detail, so, um, and titration, so I will skip over that. But in 2014, the heart Rhythm Society developed an expert consensus statement about the arrhythmia management of sarcoidosis. And really it includes the, some guidance and recommendations for cardiac sarcoid, treating the extra cardiac sarcoidosis, screening for cardiac involvement, managing arrhythmias for cardiologists and electrophysiologists, stratifying sudden, sudden death uh, risk, and then um, when to consider ICD placements. So, um, Transplantation is, for cardiac sarcoid is rare. However, it remains a possibility for younger patients with severe end stage, irreversible fail, cardiac uh, failure, resistant VT. Um, but again, it is limited because um, a lot of the time that these patients have extra cardiac uh, involvement. So it limits um, their, their transplant candidacy. And of course, treating heart failure with guideline-directed medical therapy. So key points in my talk. The diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid requires a high degree of clinical suspicion. And then um, it should be a multimodality diagnostic approach. Advanced imaging is useful for early diagnosis and prognosis. And uh, you know, as we know, the earlier we detect cardiac sarcoid and treat it, the better the outcome. And then given that sarco uh, sarcoidosis is a multi-system disease, it really should be a multidisciplinary approach for treatment. So involving not just cardiologists, advanced imagers, and um, rheumatologists as well. These are my resources. I've linked it into this QR code for your viewing pleasure. So you could scan it and check out the, the articles or links 
um, that I provide for you. And thank you for listening to my talk. This is a picture of a horse with um, cutaneous sarcoidosis. And I'll take any questions. Thank you, Annie. Um, a very uh, nice review. Um, I hope I didn't miss this. I had to unfortunately field a couple of phone calls during your talk. So I hope if I miss this part, I apologize. But this horse with cutaneous sarcoid um, or possibly a patient referred with pulmonary sarcoid, um, how would you, with, without any apparent cardiac issues, how would you approach that particular patient? I mean, I know you sort of covered this a little bit, but just sort of yeah. summarize sort of your approach to the extra cardiac sarcoid patient referred to you, a cardiologist. Right. So um, we talked about the common presentation of, of cardiac sarcoid. So that includes, you, usually you'll see like 60% with like AV blocks or some type of AV nodal disease, bundle branch blocks. So things like that should raise a red flag. Like, should I consider um, screening them for sarcoidosis, cardiac sarcoidosis? So they, they have none of that. Sorry to interrupt, but they have none of that. They just come in like, hey, I was diagnosed right. with pulmonary sarcoid and my pulmonologist wanted me to see you. What, what would you do? You know, and they don't have any cardiac history, normal EKG, normal exam, et cetera. Right. So right now, none of the guidelines recommend just screening for cardiac sarcoid if you have a system, if you have systemic sarcoid without any of the cardiac manifestation. So I think it's, you know, it would just be surveillance until you, if there's anything that raises a red flag and then you would go for screening because if, you know, it's, it's not, it's not inexpensive to uh, test someone for cardiac sarcoid, right? So MRI is expensive. Uh, FDG pets expensive and and um, going under a endomyocardial biopsies is expensive and invasive. Not even an echo then. I guess that's my question. Is oh, you, an if echo. A person, would you send them for an echo at least? So, I echo is non-invasive. It's cheap, but it has low sensitivity. So you would only detect it in a quarter of a patient. I. For me, I think I would start, personally, I would start with an echo, but again, keeping in mind that it's only 25% sensitive. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think that's what most people do with low threshold for further imaging, if there's any sort of symptoms or, or you know, abnormalities whatsoever on the echo. But right, I think if, you know, clinically no cardiac symptoms and a completely normal echo, I think you're probably, you probably feel in a normal EKG, you probably feel pretty good at that point. So. Right. Hey, hey, Robbie, this is, this is mine. Um, that's a great talk, Annie. You know, I have lost track of the number of uh, pathology reports of explanted hearts, post transplants or core biopsies, um, uh, you know, uh, after LVAD that have shown non caseating granuloma. Uh, it just tells us that we sort of miss this a lot. Now, the vast majority of the time, you don't have cardiac sarcoidosis without pulmonary sarcoidosis, but we see exceptions to that rule all the time. Um, so so I, think, I think it's important to realize that we miss this left and right. My sense is if someone has... Uh, extra pulmonary or extra cardiac sarcoid they have a very low threshold to test them further, at least an EKG and uh, an echo and if, and scrutinize that echo very carefully. And if you see anything abnormal, have a low threshold to further testing. Uh, Kunal is our in-house expert. I don't think I see him on the call, but, but, but my, my uh, sense has been that to do both MRI and pet at the same time for a baseline. And so the, the MRI sort of tells you, tells you a little bit about scar and, and, but it doesn't tell you anything about activity. Um, uh, and the, the pet, and again, I'm thank you for pointing out the importance of the diet. The pet is more for disease monitoring long-term. So you would just get the MRI and the pet as a baseline, and then you would follow patient response with the pet, uh, trying to trying to uh, limit steroids and use alternatives to steroids. And you mentioned the, 
TNF alpha blockade, et cetera. So that's that's sort of a, a general framework of an approach. I don't know if it's the right approach. Um, I think this is an area where reasonable people can have very different opinions. Hey, Mon, I'm on. Um, it's Kunal. Hey, Kunal. And, thanks. Uh, yeah, no, I, I completely echo everything you've said. Any good talk. Um, yeah, sarcoidosis, you know, the more patients I see with sarcoidosis, I feel like the more confused I get um, about what strategies to pursue, the treatment modalities, when to re-image them, um, when to taper off steroids. I mean, this is a growing field um, with a lot of unknowns. Um, but I, but I echo Mon. I, I think we miss this diagnosis quite often. Um, in the patient with uh, the patient that Robbie presented, someone with pulmonary sarcoidosis, boy, if they've got anything cardiac, you know, um, I would almost make it a point to to rule out cardiac sarcoid. And the patient basically would have in my opinion, cardiac sarcoid until proven otherwise. Meaning if someone has pulmonary sarcoid and they come to you for you know, uh, either heart failure symptoms or palpitations or abnormal EKG, I mean, it almost, the onus is on us to prove that it is not cardiac sarcoid and chances are that it's going to be cardiac sarcoid. Um, and I, I've been wrong about this before. Um, I've shared a patient with Dr. Magoras who had pulmonary sarcoid and came in with sort of pseudo- low EF, 45%, and did a cardiac MRI, which didn't show anything. And, and so we went pursuing all kinds of other tests. And in the end, he was in the unit dying and Mon got an FDG PET and it lit up. Um, and so I think to second Mon's um, point, I think just don't stop at cardiac MRI. If your suspicion is high that this person may have cardiac MRI, I mean, a cardiac sarcoid, um, just like in a PE, you've got to keep doing more and more tests until um, you find it. Um, MRI oftentimes is hard in these patients because before I get to them, uh, Mon, most, most of them have, have developed heart block and have gotten a defibrillator pacemaker put in. And then the, the images are completely skewed and you cannot tell much. So I rely heavily on FDG PET. Um, Annie, through your lit review, did you see anything about you know, timing of um, re-imaging with PET. I mean, this is a topic that's not clear. Um, what do you think, Annie? Annie, are you muted? Well, I tell you, I think my approach has been to treat for three to six months with steroids. And I usually, you know, the, I think we used to think that we needed a lot of steroids to treat sarcoid. Um, there are clinical trials ongoing now worldwide looking at no more than 40 milligrams of prednisone. Um, so you don't need the 80 um, milligrams um, and just 40 milligrams in general would do it. And then doing a tapering dose for six months and then re-image them with an FDG PET in six months. And if, if the, the inflammation is gone, then you can consider switching them to a, to a steroid sparing agent at that point. Um, and if the patient has had a lot of clinical recurrences that considering them on low dose steroids and um, a steroid sparing agent. In fact, for our transplanted patients, we've now um, kept them on uh, some prednisone lifelong as a protocol um, for the fear of recurrence as well. Sorry, I didn't realize my, my mic was muted for the last question. Um, Andy, great job. Um, Andy Smith here. I, I love the QR code. Took a picture okay. of it from Zoom and... Uh, <laughs> First time I've seen that in one of our conferences. Nice job. Um, one question, then I guess to the echocardiographers, it, it's not uncommon that an echo is done and somebody puts in there, well, consider um, infiltrative cardiomyopathy. Um, and sometimes these occur in patients who have 
end-stage renal disease who um, you know, have hypercalcemia and just have sort of bright echoes with hypertrophy. But when, <laughs> when people see that, they say, oh, infiltrative cardiomyopathy, is this amyloid or sarcoid? And to me, those two diseases shouldn't even be mentioned in the same sentence based on an echo finding. So could anybody comment as to um, whether sarcoid ever actually looks like amyloid? Kanal? Yeah, I agree with you, um, Dr. Smith. They, they usually present very different in phenotype. Um, sarcoid, at least when we see it, is more of a dilated phenotype and rarely ever has the same kind of um, bright echoes that we see in amyloid with the LV thickness. Um, so I agree with you. It, it does not, um, while they are infiltrative diseases, they should not present the same way on, on imaging. Right. And so, I, you know, I've, people put in their assessment, you know, consider sarcoid or amyloid or whatever. And it just, it just doesn't fit the, the phenotype. And um, I, I recall a, uh, a patient um, back in the late 80s when I was a fellow in, at Temple in Philadelphia who had ptosis and then <laughs> later had bilateral ptosis. And we searched up and down to make the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis, biopsied multiple times, trying to biopsy at the basal areas and uh, could not make the diagnosis. And ultimately the patient had transplant had, you know, diffuse severe um, sarcoidosis. So it, it is a, quite an elusive uh, diagnosis, but um, these patients can develop uh, ptosis. And Dr. Smith, what I tell the, the fellows is if you see a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with wall motion abnormalities, it's one that you've got to keep high on your differential for sarcoid. Um, because a lot of times our heart failure patients have had a heart cath with non-obstructive non CAD, and then you see all these basal wall motion abnormalities. Um, yeah, I think people just like look at them because they- I hate to think of all the cases I've missed over the years, but- <laughs> I was going to say people, I think people just like mention them together in echo reports because they rhyme amyloid and sarcoid, but that's not, they don't have much. <laughs> I think in cardiac MRI reports, sometimes you'll see it because they can have. And hemorrhoid. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Mon, for that. I think on cardiac MRI, Dr. Smith, sometimes they'll mention both in the same as a differential because they can both have patchy gadolinium enhancement. But that is totally a very unique MRI report um, that should not carry over to, to ECHO. I agree. Annie, uh, a question from the audience, a one-word question from Terry, Holter question mark. I assume he's asking sort of, I, I, I'm going to read his mind, in an asymptomatic patient with, I don't know whether it's either cardiac or non-cardiac sarcoid, how aggressive are, should we be in monitoring these patients for arrhythmias with ambulatory monitoring? I mean, I, obviously if someone comes in with palpitations and syncope, we're, they're gonna get it. But what if, what if you have a non, or excuse me, an asymptomatic patient? What, any, any thoughts on monitoring those patients? Here's Terry possibly clarifying. Yeah, so like the patient I described, a patient with, let's say non-cardiac, no non-cardiac sarcoid asymptomatic, you know, we mentioned maybe an echo as the starting point besides EKG and physical exam and history. Yeah, maybe great an echo is the starting point. What about ambulatory monitoring for that patient? Yeah, well, just like Dr. Um, Bot said that, you know, it's sarcoidosis is often missed and underdiagnosed. And just from the autopsy studies that I presented, right now we about two to three percent, it's estimated like less than five percent of, of patients who have other systemic forms of uh, sarcoidosis are actually um, also have a clinical cardiac sarcoidosis, but in the autopsy report, it's up to a, or a third of, a pa of the patient. So we should be thinking about um, cardiac sarcoidosis in someone with pulmonary sarcoidosis as in this uh, patient you're presenting. And things like EKG, Holter monitor and echo, they're non-invasive, they're affordable, they're cheap, or just screening things that we should consider, so. I think I would. Let me, let, me, let me make a point. I'd like to get your, your opinion and Kunal's opinion on it. You know, um, 
if I remember correctly, um, if someone has cardiac sarcoidosis, it's a class 2A recommendation to get an ICD, um, if I remember correctly on the HRS guidelines. So, so if someone has cardiac sarcoidosis, you just put an ICD, at least that's been my, my approach. Um, if someone does not have cardiac sarcoidosis, you have to be aggressive with screening. But again, I'd like, I'd like to get, I'd like to get others opinion on this. Yeah, I agree, Mon. We're very aggressive with pr protecting them with defibrillators. The one thing I will say, Annie, is, um, and, and part of what I was hoping you would mention is how difficult the criteria are, HRS, the Japanese criteria are a little bit more lenient, but the HRS criteria require you to have some kind of pathologic evidence um, of uh, non-caseating granulomas. So we get a lot of these isolated cardiac sarcoid patients. And if you look at the literature, that should be an extremely, extremely rare situation, yet we see it quite often in cardiology. And it is very difficult to conclusively say the patient has sarcoid unless you find it on a tissue biopsy and then myocardial biopsy is so low yield. Um, you know, I have had our electrophysiologists and I know um, Dr. Smith and Dr. Laskar and my colleagues have sometimes asked um, Dr. Lloyd um, and the, um, Dr. Westerman and such to voltage map the myocardium and then areas that have no voltage um, presume that that is potentially a non-caseating granuloma and biopsy that area in the EP lab. Um, that's sort of, you know, uh, endomyocardial biopsy 202. Uh, what I do is 101 in the echo lab. Um, and, and sometimes that improves your yield, but still, still not above 40 to 50%. So we're just bad at finding it on biopsy. Um, and the criteria make it very difficult to, to say conclusively. So a lot of times we're people putting people on steroids with a probable sarcoid diagnosis. Um, and this is why it requires a multidisciplinary approach with rheumatology, pulmonology, uh, and us sort of on board because it's these are caustic drugs. Right, exactly. Um, and yes, you're right. HRS criteria does require the histologic diagnosis of uh, the non-caseating granulomas, which we can always get. So, and also thank you for mentioning um, EP guided endomyocardial biopsy. I did run into that too uh, during my search. I was an important sure. point though, an important point though, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a, a heart pathology diagnosis. It can be anywhere in the body. Isn't that right? That's right. That's why the FDG PET is so useful because you get a full body PET and that way, even if, you know, the heart areas are, are hard to reach on biopsy, if you find a lymph node, then we can reach for that. And that could, you know, that could make it more of a convincing diagnosis. So I really use FDG PET a lot and usually go for the full body when you're initially diagnosing somebody. When you're just following up activity after treatment, then you can just do a cardiac PET. But when you're looking for initial diagnostic purposes, I would really encourage you to do a full body PET. Uh, Annie Stan Sherman, uh, I was fascinated by your case that your patient did so well. And, uh, you know, I wonder if having a negative MRI and having a positive uh, uh, FDG scan uh, is a prognostic for a good outcome with steroids. A great question. Um, the patient that we have had a negative MRI, but a positive FDG PET, which shows that there was active uh, inflammation. So what we did was actually we treated him with pulsed steroids for a couple of days and then trans transitioned him to high dose steroids. Um, and by the end of the hospitalization, his EF improved from 20% to 50%. He did well over for a while, but because he did have active RV disease, as uh, one of the studies showed, if you have focal FDG uptake on in the RV, you are at a five-fold increase for cardiac death and BT, which is eventually a year later he did pass from non-sustained or from sustained BT. Yeah, uh, interesting, you know, just, uh, and did, did the radiologist go back over the MRI and say it was still totally normal or did y'all right. give him a chance to 
there, there wasn't any late Gadolinian um, enhancement. And so because of the echo, that's what prompted us to further investigate for sarcoid. And, and that's when we made the diagnosis or cardiac sarcoid. And that's when we made the diagnosis. Well, good job. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, I think this exists in the literature too, but to Herman's point, um, the earlier disease, the better the patients do, which is like probably in every single disease. But, you know, if you find it where it's not caused scar tissue yet, but has only just active inflammation, that's the best chances of disease and improving outcomes. Right, exactly. That's why there should be more awareness of thinking about making the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid, because early detection means early treatment, better outcomes. Any, uh, this is Mahmoud. This is Mahmoud Abdu. I'm, I have a, uh, a question for you and uh, Kunal. First of all, good job, uh, good uh, review. So I'm gonna take uh, uh, Robbie's same example patient, uh, pulmonary sarcoid, no cardiac manifestations. And uh, that patient has a family, first degree family history of sudden cardiac death. Um, does that change your approach at all? Number one, number two, um, have you came across any um, information or data about inheritance of this disease and what's the kind of uh, pattern of inheritance, if any? Great question, thank you. Um, I didn't run into anything, anything in my literature review about it being um, genetically inherited because it's, it's an autoimmune disease. If you do have an autoimmune disease, especially depending on your um, ethnicity, like Scandinavian, Japanese, and African-Americans are at higher risk of, of having sarcoid. Um, that's something to think about. But so far in terms of the pathophysiology of why someone is more prone to develop uh, sarcoidosis, it, they've mostly found that it's environmental factors like beryllium dust or um, other antigens that would provoke these uh, inflammatory responses or infections like mycobacterium, um, but not necessarily that it's genetic. So, but it would, it would make me think a little bit harder for screening of um, cardiac sarcoid if there is a family history of, of uh, sudden cardiac death because, you know, their family so genetically you know, if they're African American, Japanese especially, as we could see from the studies, that um, up to like close to sixty percent of Japanese patients that has systemic sarcoid has cardiac sarcoid that's undiagnosed based on the autopsy study. So I would consider those factors too. Mahmoud um, and any, I think what you meant to say is that we know that the disease is epigenetic in nature, meaning there is some genetic predisposition. Um, because we know that there are clusters of families with sarcoidosis. However, there's an environmental exposure that brings out the phenotype. So it's not always the case that people will get the disease even within those same family clusters. Um, so the, the key word there is epigenetic. And Mahmoud, there's not a single mutation that we know to look for. It's probably very polymorphic. Um, and so th there's not ways to screen patients genetically for sarcoid. Um, even when there's a family history of it. Um, so, so, but yeah, if there's a family history of sun death and, and you're worried about somebody with pulmonary sarcoid, boy, you'd be very, very keen on trying to look at their myocardium closely. And that's what I, that's what I, that's what I remember uh, that, you know, there's no genetic testing and it's epigenetic. And um, that's what I uh, remember vividly about this. But uh, the fact that some, you know, they have a family history of, uh, sudden cardiac death tells me that, and the patient has pulmonary sarcoid, tells me that there may be both related. And, you know, for me, I would probably be um, full blown FDG pet, whole body, trying to detect something uh, and make sure that I'm not missing it. So thank you. Kunal, uh, in retrospect, Stan Sherman again, in retrospect, uh, do we think that we that ICDs really prolong life in these patients clearly and with this particular patient presentation would you have thought about an ICD just because the right right ventricle was involved or what, what's your thought on that? Yeah, Dr. Sherman, that's a tough one. Um, I, I think we're very aggressive about ICDs. Um, I think 
definitely, you know, could have been a consideration. Um, we have had patients who have had cardiac sarcoid and have, you know, um, uh, have been rescued from single VT episodes and then go on to live, um, you know, for, for years without any other issues. So I, I definitely think it prolongs life, but I don't know if I have hard data on that to support um, my clinical experience, um, but I'm sure it exists because it's a 2B recommendation, I think. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.